Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, it's good to have everybody in the room. And just so you know, we're not live streaming this, but we're taping it uh, for other folks who couldn't physically be with us today. As folks know, the carbon pipelines are impacting landowners and tribes in Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota, Illinois, and now potentially we're here in Wyoming is going to potentially be a place where they try to sequester uh, some of the liquid carbon into the ground as well. Um, so folks from other states couldn't travel with us today, uh, but we have a really good expert panel of fellow landowners who've been through pipeline fights um, that I'm going to facilitate some questions through. And then we have Brian Jordy. He's our lead attorney with the Eastman Action Teams that are operating now in Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, and North Dakota. And that website is also now live where you can get to the individual states. So it's called Eastman LLC because these pipeline companies call themselves LLCs so they can just dissolve when something goes wrong. So we decided to add that to our name too. But ours stands for Landowners Legal Cooperative <laughs> instead of Limited Liability Corporation, which is what their stands for. Uh, so you just go to Eastman LLC. You can always tell your fellow landowners that website as well, so they can sign up to be part of the legal co-op, which Brian's going to talk more about. And then just some logistics. We have paperwork in the room, uh, a landowner's guide to fighting pipelines. This came out way before we even dreamed that a carbon pipeline could be a thing. So carbon pipelines are not specifically discussed in there, but look, there's a lot of similarities between oil and craft gas pipelines. So that's going to be helpful for you. Plus, we have some information you can bring to your county commissions. Uh, that is going to be one of the next fronts that a lot of us are working hard at, is making sure that county commissioners know what they can and cannot do around carbon pipelines, how they can create setbacks and stronger road call agreements and lots of other uh, pieces of regulations that they can do at the county level if the state's not enforcing carbon pipelines, which none of our states are. Uh, so we have all that paperwork here as well. And then we have signs. So uh, Jeff gave us the idea of the big signs. So we have big signs that people can take. We have no trespassing signs that you can put on your fence. Um, and then we have the yard signs that you can stick in the ground or along uh, beautiful rural roads so people see it. All right, and if you don't know who I am, I'm Jane Kleb. I started a group called Bold Nebraska at the end of 2009. We uh, did not start as an environmental or a climate group. In fact, we started to try to bridge rural and urban communities because that's what I always hear uh, pundits say, that the divides between rural and urban folks are too big, so might as well just give up and everyone kind of live in their own bubble. And I, having lived in DC and Philly and then married a few rancher, uh, know that actually there's a lot of similarities of the issues that we all care about. So that's why we created Bold. And then about six months after we started the organizations, uh, the organization is when Keystone XL came knocking on Nebraskan's door. And so that's how we got involved in fighting pipelines. I would have never known that I could have become an expert on pipelines and how the federal and state and county regulations all work together, the use of eminent domain, all of that was stuff that we had to learn or get taught by Ryan, <laughs> especially around the new domain. Um, and so we now are helping states all across the country. And groups of landowners that have linked arms with tribes um, have stopped pipelines in Nebraska, Minnesota, uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, in Oregon, all around protecting people's property rights and sovereign rights of tribes. So in today's panel, we're going to really get to the heart of why people decided to stand up and protect their property rights and to talk about some of the tactics that pipeline companies use. We're definitely going to leave lots of time for you to ask questions. And then after the, uh, the panel, Brian's going to come up and talk about the Eastman Action Team model, making sure that you don't have any questions about that. I know several of you in the group have already signed up to be part of it. And then we'll go from there. All right. Enjoy. You come up whenever you feel you want to come up. In the background, you may be wondering what all those pictures are. Um, we, you know, 
did a lot of actions over the 12 years of working together to stop the Keystone XL pipeline. We built barns in the route because their contracts say you can't build permanent structures, so we decided well, we'll build something that symbolizes rural communities. Um, we carved pumpkins. I mean, we did every action we could dream up. So as the landowners are speaking and as Joy is speaking, um, you'll see lots of beautiful faces of people who got involved in this fight to protect their land and water. Okay. Um, I'm going to ask questions, and each of you are going to pass the mic to answer them. And since I'm turning 49 in a few days, I now have to wear readers. Um, <laughs> my kids laugh because I have them literally scattered around the house now. Uh, so I have now officially become my mother and my grandmother. Um, okay, first question. Each of you have a story on how you got involved in deciding to stand up to a pipeline corporation. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself and what was the main driver for you not only getting engaged, but staying engaged. You want to go first, go ahead. <laughs> um, I don't know. Well, can you hear me if I talk loud enough? Chante washte na pe chiyo da hapi, wambli wia kawi imachi hapi, ampetu washte yu hapi. My name is uh, Joy Braun, our eagle feather woman. I'm a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux Tribe in South Dakota, so I'm Lakota. Our, what we call ourselves is Oteti Shafoli, but our treaties are under the Great Sioux Nation name. And um, I got involved in, in, in fighting against um, uh, pipelines uh, after we started saving the buffalo on my reservation. So our buffalo had been put in, into um, into hawk, and so we went. We saved the buffalo, and the next thing I knew, they were telling me this Keystone XL, this tar sands pipeline, was going to come straight through our reservation. Well, we said no. <laughs> we said no, and um, I oftentimes I was the only one standing outside along the highway or standing in front of a fracking truck, or standing in front of a pipe truck, or rolling me in front of a pipe truck to actually stop, stop it. Because on the reservation, we have our own laws. And we have the right to say what goes on within the exterior boundaries of our own reservation. So we have put into laws in place like megalos laws. We put in laws in place about pipe load laws. We put in laws about, about nuclear waste and chemical waste that could, trans, that could go across our reservation. And we even extended that when the COVID crisis hit, we said that, that we were going to allow certain um, people to come onto our reservation, tourists and things. We allowed commerce, but we didn't allow tourists and things to come on. So those are some of the things that we can do within the exterior boundaries of, of our reservation because we have, we have, we, we can put laws into place like that. But I got involved because they wanted to go straight through our reservation and right through historical sites and burial sites of people that, you know, this is less than a hundred years. And people think that this is way long time ago that our people were put on reservations. They were put on reservations in the late 1880s. But remember, we weren't allowed even to vote until 1953. We weren't allowed to practice our religion until 1978. I remember going to sun dances. I remember going to sweat lodges and there would be FBI sitting on top of the hill. I'm only 53 years old. So it's not that long ago. <laughs> so we have an absolute inherent right to say what goes on in our land. And when the Keystone Exile fight first started going on, we started hearing about landowners standing up and saying they didn't want this to cross their land. And there was a running joke among the Lakota, well, now you know what it feels like to have the government come in <laughs> and to try to yeah, take your land and take true. away your rights and take away what, your heritage. 
But what we've come to recognize and understand is that these are our friends, these are our allies, these are our family, these are the stewards of the land that have been our ancestral land for tens of thousands of years, and that we have bridged that gap. There's still a ways to go in some areas, but we have bridged that gap here. We have shown the world that you can unite in a common cause to protect the land, the water, our heritage, and our rights. So that's why I always make the effort to come back to Nebraska. Besides that, I was born in Nebraska. <laughs> I was actually born in Winnebago. So I like coming to Nebraska. But that's why I stood up against the Keystone XL. And then when those grassroots people at Standing Rock called, because we had one keystone, one of the many times, one of the four times, when, when Standing Rock called and said, come and help, then I went up there and I was the very first camper. And this nose hose is because of what pipeline companies will do. This nose holes is what Energy Transfer Partners did to me. Kelsey Warren did this to me. When they took out stuff from my lungs, they found pumice, lava rock in my lungs. I've been tear gassed and pepper sprayed and rubber bullets. And we withstood over eight hours, eight hours of water cannons. We never had guns. If we would have had guns and pipe bombs like they said we would, they would have come in with the army and wiped us out. We were nonviolent. We were prayerful. The only violence perpetuated at us at Standing Rock was by the police and Tiger Swan and Energy Transfer Partners. Over 100 people have died from diseases from Energy Transfer Partners and Tiger Swan. Anyway, so that's why I stand up. Because I don't want to have happen this to happen to these people or to you or to your relatives or to your children. We have to think of the next seven generations ahead. Okay. Thank you, Joy. My name is Ed Fishback. I uh, am a farmer and landowner in South Dakota. First of all, I want to say, people in Nebraska, your fight on Keystone is what inspired me to get involved on the carbon dioxide fight and summit. I've been following your fight for the last 12 years and going on Bull's website and keeping track of things. And I want to admire you folks for hanging in there and winning the fight, because you have won. And that inspires us to show that people coming together and organizing at the grassroots level, you can beat these big money interests. They've got the money, but we've got the people. My experience with Summit Carbon Solutions uh, started back in July of last year, the end of July. My wife and I were driving to Minnesota for my niece's wedding for the weekend. We had picked up our mail, and as I was driving, she was opening the mail, and she came across this letter from this company we'd never heard of before informing us that it was going to cross uh, my home quarter and my quarter across to my house and another 80 acres that I own a little bit away from my place. It bothered me all weekend and when I came back, got home on Sunday night and Monday, I started making a couple of phone calls to neighbors to see if anybody else had gotten them and of course some had. Uh, so the first thing I did was decide that I'm going to have a landowner meeting in my community just to see how people felt about this pipeline. Maybe I was the only one who was going to be against it. So I organized a meeting in early November of my landowners, and I made about four or five phone calls is all I did because we never knew who was going to be affected because Summit refuses to this day to give a list of who the landowners are. So you can only figure it out by just talking to one another. I thought maybe I'd have 10 or 12 people show up. We had 67 in my little town of Millette come in. 
That told me then that we weren't alone. Uh, Summit, I should back up to, Summit had their first public meeting on the issue then in October, October 26th. And they had an Aberdeen. And we, I walked into that meeting, and the meeting was packed. I know there were almost 200 people there. And Summit gives their presentation. They go on about 45 minutes, and they give their uh, tell how great it's going to be. And uh, I was the first member from the audience to get up. And I wanted the first question I asked was, do you intend to use eminent domain on the farmers that don't support this? And the gentleman's name is Chris Hill. He does all their PR stuff at the public meeting. Said he tried to avoid the question. He said, "We're going to get everybody on voluntarily." And I said, "You didn't ask my question. I want to know are you going to use eminent domain for those of us that don't support this?" And finally, he admitted that yes, they would. And then, from then on, after he answered the question. When I sat down, it just it, it just took off the opposition. People were getting up and were very angry about that. And so afterwards, I didn't know a lot of these people. People were running up to me and we were exchanging phone numbers and giving our names out and said, we gotta organize, we gotta stop this thing. That's how that all began. Immediately after I came back from my niece's wedding, and we got the letters, within just three or four days, we already had surveyors showing up in our area. And, uh, and we, so we battled them all last fall and last summer. At least once a week, there were surveyors, and every week it would be a license plate from a different state, it seemed like. It was never the same people. And a couple times we caught them trespassing, and we called the sheriff. And there are reports filed with our county sheriff that but our state's attorney hasn't proceeded with any charges on them, but they do have a record of it. So they've been doing that all last fall and even into this year. And I gotta tell you, just last week, the Saturday, just last Saturday before Easter Sunday, I had two more of them go, my, go by my farm with an unmarked pickup, tinted windows, speeding, and stopped on the road crossways and started digging with a shovel in the middle of our township road. And so I drove down there and I said, what are you doing here? They said, we're surveying. And I said, are you at Summit? Yes. And I said, you need to get out of here. Our township, by the way, has passed a unanimous resolution opposing this, our township board. We don't want them in there. We don't want anything to do with it. But they continue to come back. They were from Louisiana. I did call the sheriff again and reported them. They're getting cute. They've been turned off, turned away on, uh, by the landowners. They can't, in South Dakota, we have a trespass law. They can't go on without our permission. So now they're setting up their tripods and they're doing their surveys from the middle of the road right away and on the approaches because they can get away with that. And uh, the same surveyor showed up a couple of days later and my sister-in-law, who happens to be 76 years old, sat out and followed the surveyors in her vehicle, just stayed back a ways and watched them for a couple hours. Pretty soon, the deputy sheriff from Brown County, where she lives, showed up in her yard and said that they had turned her in for harassing them. Two 40-year-old men had turned in my 76-year-old sister-in-law for harassing them. So that's what they're doing now. They're gonna to try to turn the tables and they'll go into the PUC and try to tell them we've got landowners harassing them. She hadn't even talked to them, she hadn't approached them. And by the way, that same day, they had set up on my brother's approach on the right away, their tripod, and he, had, he went down and put two hay bales, one on each side, two big round bales. And when they came back, they took their pickup and pushed one of the hay bales out into his field so they could get their stuff off of there. So, I mean, they did uh, push on his personal property. But, so that's what we've been going through with surveyors constantly. Um, but even people that let them survey, they've come to realize now that it was a mistake. And we have a lot of opposition. And I just want you to know, you're not alone here in Nebraska. In South Dakota, we've had five Public Utilities Commission hearings and they have been well attended and the opposition has been overwhelming. We had, they had one in Sioux Falls, which we were concerned that that might be the toughest one. 
There were over 400 people there against it. The only people that are testifying in favor of these hearings are the CEOs of an ethanol company or two and maybe one or two of their board members. Everything else is the landowners are against it. We're against it for three reasons. One, we, like you folks, we don't believe eminent domain should be, in or, should be used by a private company to take our land. We're concerned about the uh, safety of the carbon dioxide thing. And when we hold our landowner meetings, the first thing we do is when people enter the doorway, we have the slide presentation up with a test rupture, yeah. where the plume is up in the air. And then we have articles of the uh, rupture in Satarsha, Mississippi, where it gassed over 300 people and 40 some ended up in a hospital or whatever. That really changes a lot of minds. And people see that. So that's the other reason, the safety. And the third one is the lack of transparency by this company. They will tell you anything. They lie. They are not transparent. They refuse to tell us who their investors are. They refuse to tell us who the affected landowners are. Just last, when we had the deadline to our PUC to be interveners at the last minute, they, they tell us they've changed the route. And one hour before the deadline, they come up with this little scheme to try to throw out half of our opposition. And, and thanks to Brian, it didn't work. Um, so, and I wanted you to know that when we first started this, my first call was to Dakota Rural Action. That's the organization we have in South Dakota. We're, they're not as strong as Bold is, um, but we're getting there. And uh, I told them we need you to get involved in this. I did that last July. And my second point to them was, you get me Brian Jordy. Because I don't care if anybody else hires him, I'm going to hire him for mine. Because I've watched what that law firm has done for you folks. Yeah. And i got to tell you, Jane came up to two of our hearings in person at Redfield and Aberdeen in my area. I didn't, I'd never met her in person before, but she was a rock star. She took on Summit, and i got to give her credit. There are so many people, I got so many comments from what you did. And uh, so we really appreciate what you've done. But I just want you to know, you may hear a lot about all the opposition in Iowa, and there is. But I can assure you, South Dakota is strongly against this. We really are. I mean, we've got blocks from my county all the way. I live in Spink. And then north of me is Brown, that's where Aberdeen is. And then you go up into McPherson, that's right up to the North Dakota border. I can hardly find anybody that's going to give them an easement. And when Summit is out at their promotional things, they've got a screen up there. They're still telling people they're going to get 100% voluntary easements. They're lying. They put it up on a screen and tell you that. And they're telling our PUC that that's what they're going to do. And the same time they held the hearings and told us that that's what they were going to do, they had already applied in Iowa for eminent domain. But yet they're telling us in South Dakota they don't intend to use it. So that's what I mean about the lack of transparency. You can't trust them. So anyhow, I'm glad to be here. And thank you, folks, for what you did on Keystone, because you have inspired us and given us an example of how to proceed in South Dakota. My next. Uh, my name is Randy Thompson, and I guess to put it in a nutshell, I have spent my life in the cattle business in one form or another. As a farmer and a rancher in my younger days, eventually got into the livestock marketing business. I had uh, actually owned a sale barn at Albion for many years, just about 40 miles from here, and then after I sold the sale barn, I went into the cattle buying business and I bought for small feedlot operations. A lot of my old customers at the sale barn um, actually had me buy cattle for them. And then I retired just a few years ago. And I guess I should add one other thing to my, yeah, I'm a pipeline fighter. I started opposing the Keystone XL back in 2007. When TransCanada showed up at my 90-year-old mother's doorstep, thinking they had a right to use her land. I thought maybe they were a little bit late for the party to be getting on a piece of the cake, because the party had started a long time ago, and my folks 
first got married back in the early days of uh, <clears throat> the drought and the depression and all of that. And they, they got married in 33 and they didn't raise a crop until 1940. So they had put some struggles in and then they spent many years renting land and you know just barely making a living. But they did finally get enough money put together to buy this land. So to me, now Trans Canada wanted to come in and they felt like they were entitled to use that. And I said, hell no, not on my watch. You have not earned the right to use their property because they spent a lifetime getting here. And so that really built the fire under me. In fact, preparing for today, I kind of found some old emotions coming out, Jane. <laughs> but it's something that really, it's not right. You know what? I guess I have to blame my folks for the way I am because they taught me to be a decent person, to be honest. You don't take things from other people that don't belong to you. But that's not what these pipeline companies believe in. So, I'm very glad folks are here today. I think that's a very good first step in stopping the pipeline. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, my name's Art Chandrup. I live north of Neely. And uh, we are on the Keystone route, Keystone XL. And now uh, we're finding out that uh, uh, summit is about uh, two and a half miles north of us. Anyhow, we, we became involved in this back, it's just about our 10th year anniversary of becoming involved. Uh, back then, um, I, I'm a retired school teacher, taught school for 35 years, and we moved back to my wife's family farm north of Neely. And, you know, like a lot of people wanting to retire, we wanted to farm some small farm wanted to farm, we wanted to travel, and we wanted to um, uh, spend time with our grandkids. Well, it was first part of May, 10 years ago, 2012. I'm out uh, planting soybeans. My wife comes out and says, you need to come to the house. There's somebody here. So I go up to the house, and here's this lady, a land agent for Trans Canada. And we, you know, really didn't know a lot about the pipeline at that time, just like a lot of you don't know a lot about these carbon pipelines right now. And so we listened to her spiel, and of course she wanted to sign an easement and do all kinds of things, and, you know, all your neighbors are signing and all that kind of stuff. And, and boy, it's, uh, you know, this is, uh, you use fuel, so by golly, uh, you need to support this because this is going to provide fuel for the future for America. It's, uh, you know, when she got done and left, it was like we felt like, God, are we un American for maybe having doubts about this? But I left her with, I said, okay, I, you know, I, I have a master's degree plus. I said, I do my research before I make decisions. So I said, there's no way we're getting into something like this until we do the research and find out exactly what it is and what's going to happen and what the dangers are, et cetera, et cetera. So we started doing that research. And in uh, I don't know, a few weeks, probably, there was a meeting in Neely uh, that Jane had hosted. And uh, we got into that and started learning about that. But in the meantime, We've been doing a, a lot of research about this, and I'm saying, we don't want this thing. And the more we learned, the more we said, we don't want this thing. And uh, so that, uh, that kind of has started a journey. That started a journey for us that just recently ended. And um, I know each of you has to, do, has to do some research and decide what you want to do. And I know I'm an ethanol lover. I think ethanol has done wonderful things for us. You know, it's helped the farmers. It's, uh, you know, I, I'm one of those guys that back 
when they first came out with gasohol. I thought, hmm, this sounds good. So I, it was hard getting the stuff, but I did burn some of it and thought, yeah, it's all right. And then when ethanol came out, you know, I started buying vehicles that would handle the E85 and so forth and, and uh, use them a lot. However, just because I love ethanol does not mean I'm for a carbon pipeline because, you know, the whole idea is to get this in places where they can use it for fracking. That's not what they're going to tell you, but that's the reality of it. That's what they want to do. So, uh, you know, I guess uh, my first thought to you is do the research and find out what this really is and how it's going to affect you and decide if you want to be tied up in a permanent easement on your property with a pipeline that could kill you someday. Okay. Excuse me. My name is Jeannie Crumley. I'm a landowner, retired English teacher, um, journalism teacher. And I, I always am a little bit astounded when I sit in the presence of people that I've come to respect so incredibly. And I don't really know what voice I have to add, but you know, I'll throw a little tidbit in. And I think the secret of the success has been everybody throws tidbits in. Some people like Al, or like Art throw the whole, the whole ball of wax in. But it, by everybody doing a little bit, we ended up creating a pretty remarkable movement. Uh, for myself, I came into this a little bit late. I missed all the fun in Washington, D.C. and the arrests and a lot of other things because like a lot of people, we only respond to something when it touches us, which is not um, a very honorable thing to say, but when it does touch you, then you have a responsibility to really become a, a, a participant. My first experience with this pipeline was when we had a phone call at 8.30 or 9 o'clock at night saying, oh, by the way, you're on the route, we'll come out in the morning with the paperwork for you to sign. And we went, paperwork to sign, you know, we're not doing anything. And then, of course, our interests were um, aroused. And then there was a meeting in O'Neill. And we went to the meeting, and a strategy became evident immediately. And that was that there were all sorts of little spots for individual landowners to ask questions. There was no unified spot. And so the idea of isolating landowners, I'll ask, answer questions about heat here, and I'll answer questions about something else here. But there was no unity. And I heard, you know, we're all just little landowners and we come by city perspectives as looking maybe a little bit naive and, and a landowner woman in her cattle working clothes went up to the fellow in the suit and asked about heat through this pipe. And he was so disrespectful in his response to her and that rubbed me wrong and there were, that was kind of the standard that we were so dumb to be asking those questions and not just take their word for it. And I went from that to a little side room where Dave Domina and Jane were presenting their perspective. And Dave said, I'm not here to fight a pipeline. I'm here. I can't tell you I'll do that. But he said, I love Northeast Nebraska and I don't like what they're trying to do to landowners. My goal would be to get you the best easement and the best protection I can provide for you. That resonated. And then Jane walks in with Jane's flair and <laughs> presents the idea that even it could be fun to do this resistance. And that combination really resonated. So my first experience participating in this world came not too long later. It was in Grand Island during a blizzard. A blizzard warning was out, so the night before my husband and I went down and got a room, we went to breakfast that morning, and there were literally people from all over the country there to protest. And we were there because it was on our land, but young kids had flown in from Oregon and New York, and they were there to protest. It was remarkable. But it was more remarkable was that we couldn't enter the building until 11 a.m. We had to be in line to get a number to actually speak. So Jane suggested we show up at 7 a.m. Remember, it's a blizzard. We showed up at 7 a.m., stood in a line outside, and Jane had organized coffee and hot chocolate and line savers. So we would stand in line when we were too cold. She had somebody hold our spot, give us hot chocolate, give us coffee, and we could go sit in the car and warm up. And that, you know, it's literal, but it's symbolic too. When you're too tired, we're there and we'll take over. And the, the, um, 
the hearing went how many hours? Eight hours, maybe 90% or 95% of the speakers were opposed. Nonetheless, the fight went on for years and the opposition went on for years. Um, so the, the thing that resonated from that is that when Keystone talked to you, their goal is to isolate you, to make you feel like you're alone and to take dominance over what the conditions are. What Neat and Bold gave was to unify, and that's powerful. Uh, what what uh, Keystone did was true mis misstatements or outright lies. Uh, they told my husband, when it leaks on your land, just pump it through your irrigation system, pump it out on the land, and it will dissipate. They literally said that. And so what our lawyers and our legal team gave us was truth about it, what Jane gave us is truth about it. And finally, what Keystone and what Summit gives is intimidation. And what this unity gives is hope. And I equate it to maybe a strand of anything, and a single strand of anything is fairly weak. But when you braid that strand, it becomes increasingly uh, strong. Uh, I had a professor once that said, one and one most often takes two. Makes two, but sometimes it makes 11. And I would say that when we have unity, we're 11, we're not two. So I would encourage you all to figure out how you can become part of it. I'm Bev Kruitz, and this is my husband, Bob, and we live at Orchard. And we got involved um, when we received the letter, well, even before that, when we saw it on the 1011 News that this pipeline was going to be coming across Antelope County. And we said, I think it comes pretty close to us because we're like right up in the corner of Antelope County and Holt County. And we were a little concerned, and then sure enough, a couple weeks later, a uh, man started protests knocking on our door and telling us that we had to sign and he said he had paperwork but he couldn't find it he was very unorganized and then a lady showed up at our house and she was from the area and she started talking to us about the pipeline and we had an exchange student at that time and he was from Sweden and he said well how is this going to help you know these people and she says I'm going to put this off to the side. She was not a land agent. She was something else in the, in the organization in Keystone. And she said, well, if it was me, I'd get educated on it. I'm a retired teacher now. And so that was just a highlight. And we had talked to Art previously to that in the week span. And he, he said, you need to get educated. We tried to find as much as we could about Keystone. And we weren't liking what we were seeing. I grew up in the 70s and part of protesting was part of my movement and I, I was, my parents raised me to speak up if there was something I didn't like. My husband and I have sat right where you people are sitting and we went to their meetings and we were told at one meeting in Neely and when I started asking questions about what was in there, what's it going to do for the environment, what's it going to do for you know the future generations and they told me don't ever come back to one of our meetings. They were waiting outside the bathroom telling me not to come back. And I said, nobody tells me what to do. You're a foreign company. And we fought for it and we've made a lot of friends here and what everybody else has said, the unity. We, one person can't do it alone. And some of our neighbors are being affected by this carbon pipeline. We were on the route and then we never heard from them and we get, he, my husband's on the planning and zoning board in Antelope County and he gets the official map and we're not on there anymore. And so it made us kind of wonder, but we'll continue to fight because we believe that we have to look out for the little generations of these two little kids over here for the future. I mean, if we don't, they're going to take everything and we're going to have nothing. And that's just why we're involved is we're looking out for the future. It isn't for the here and now, it's for the future. My name is Bob Cruz, and I want you to thank all of you for coming. First thing you want to look at is think about the cancer. You get diagnosed with cancer. You need a support group. We're here, all of us. We're here for you. That's what it's about. Brian down here, Jane up there. We're all here for you because that's what we're after is the same common goal. We, don't, we didn't fight this for the 
keystone for the money. We were on small generation, the next generation, stewards of the ground. And like our, my experience with Keystone is, is that uh, they want to individualize you and get you to sign. Because the less you know about it, the easier it is for you to sign. And it's wrong. It's you got to get educated. And I mean, there is information out there. Jane, Brian, this panel, everybody knows a lot about it. The easier it is to sell, it's just like the two sides of a coin. There's one side, and they're going to tell you all the positives. But they ain't going to tell you the other side of the coin, the negatives of it. So you got to find the medium, of this thickness of that coin. So think about it. That's what you got to do, because these land agents will tell you anything. That first day land agent we had, he was so rude, he says, well, you got to sign, you got to sign. And I said, no, my wife is at home, I'm not signing anything without her being around. He says, well, when's she going to be home? And I told her, he says, well, I'll be there at 7 o'clock. Well, 7 o'clock rolled around, 8 o'clock rolled around, 9 o'clock rolled around. I went to bed. Next day he calls and says, well, I'll be back. And, stuff. and I says, when? And he told me again. Time come around again. Ain't no show. Then this gal shows up and says, well, he's been relieved of his duties. <laughs> I would like to meet with you and stuff. And I told my wife right then, I says, well, she better be on time because I've already wasted enough time with them. And she was, but then she says, well, I'm not, you know, I normally don't do this. I do a different part. And then there was a meeting in O'Neill. And I says, well, I'm going to go to that meeting. She said, well, if I was you, I would go too. So, I mean, there was there. And then she said, offer me $500 to survey my ground, quarter. Well, I told her, I says, well, that's a problem is I have two quarters there of pasture. And the gate, only gate, is on the south end. And you are going on clear up to the north end. She said, well, I don't have any problems giving you $1,000 then. So, look, they got free money to hand out anything. So they'll tell you anything. So think about it, please. All right. My name is Eileen Kenyon. I'm from Sioux City. My property uh, is uh, actually half of my grandparents' farm, although I grew up 10 minutes away from there on another farm. Um, and, and I've been asked to talk about my experience being a CRP grower. And, uh, um, and so my little half of the quarter section that I inherited from my grandparents is in CRP, which is a really good way to sequester carbon. <laughs> um, just to identify myself, uh, although I'm from Iowa, my roots are also in Nebraska. This is a newspaper clipping of a, uh, my mother's grandfather who came from Ireland in the potato famine and came into Canada and walked across into Wisconsin and he eventually settled in uh, Coleridge area, Hardington area, before, before Laurel was even a town. He was an educator. And, uh, uh, and they lived in a, in a sod embankment, apparently, you know, a dugout. So, uh, and that's part of, you know, that, that has set part of my uh, sentiments about, you know, people wanting to take my land, you know. An easement is permanent easement. It's forever. You never get it back. You can't pass it on. Um, so, uh, I'm, you know, I, I had pictures in my mind of my parents, my grandparents, and great-grandparents, and, and all the struggles, like your families, I'm sure, just to, you know, make a living. Uh, and uh, in the way back years, not having any kinds of comforts, um, you know, carry, hand carrying water and hand feeding animals, and it, it, it was difficult. 
So that set my tenor. Um, my first knowledge and introduction to the, the pipelines and so forth was uh, the letter that came. Uh, in Iowa, we have an Iowa Utility Board, and they have a structure that we can use. Um, Iowa Utility Board it requires required navigator by navigator. That's the one that affects me. Um, and Summit and ADM to hold informational meetings. Okay, so my property is in Plymouth County. So I went to the Plymouth County meeting. They had given us all the dates and the you know addresses and so forth. And uh, of course, the, all the very young, attractive people who I counted up as most of them were lawyers up there in the front, you know, really a power play. Um, very young, attractive, intelligent, smart people and, you know, and telling us how wonderful this is going to be for farmers to have places to sell their corn and how good this would be to keep ethanol going and and how um, environmentally friendly they were. They were going to sequester all this carbon and um, yeah, I, got, I came out of that meeting and I thought, there's more to this <laughs> than they're telling us. And yeah, for sure. I, I, I have a sense that we came out of there kind of shell-shocked. Everybody was kind of wide-eyed and looking at each other and, you know, not really knowing, but probably suspecting there was more behind all the rah-rah that we got. Um, similarly, there was, uh, to this story that we just heard, there was one woman there who was aware of the Satarsha, Mississippi um, failure of a carbon dioxide pipeline. And she, um, she shared that with us who were sitting near her. And when she did speak, she you know, made sure she said, this is not right. And um, okay, so that was the Lamar's meeting uh, in Plymouth County. Then I went to the Woodbury County meeting the next night and she was there again. But they had come up to her in her, you know, where she was seated and told her to keep her mouth shut, you know? And she did, um, probably for full of repercussions, I don't know. But of course, that, you know, that alerted me and Satarsha alerted me and I, people asked me later, why are you doing what you're doing? I, because I'm not a speaker, I'm very shy, I don't get up in front of people, but I said, my hair is on fire. <laughs> you know, I, I can't, I can't sit for this. So um, I decided what I can do is I can knock on doors. And what I took was a um, plat book. I got a mouth, and I got a plat book, and I got a phone. <laughs> Copied the, some pages out of the plat book. Started uh, knocking on doors and using my yellow highlighter. And as I moved up the line, I could tell, you know, uh, um, where this pathway was, and I can show the landowners and the neighbors who their neighbors are that are also affected by this. And so they, you know, they can have some, um, some, a place to start and, and join hands with each other. Because I found that they were um, very isolated. Uh, one man was um, a <coughs> Vietnam veteran and was really against the government and he t he threw away his certified letter. He didn't want anything to do with government plan, uh, which I found uniquely interesting. But we got him, we got him plugged back in. His son was uh, quite literate with um, the issues and so uh, he's helping his dad. Another man told me who was also isolated, uh, said, I'm just one person. I didn't think there was anything I could contribute. Uh, but then pretty soon he took his uh, copy of the 
plant book pages and he was taking his own yellow highlighter and marking who his neighbors were that were affected as well. So, um, you know, what I have said is there, you know, there is value in knocking on doors and meeting people because I feel like I've been able to break them out of some of their isolation and, uh, you know, and some of them have computers but they're not very aware of how to connect with other, other people and uh, to get onto the Zoom meetings and, and uh, become educated. Fortunately in Iowa there's a, a group of women in, I believe, Iowa City who have volunteered to do a weekly newsletter for, for people who don't have computers and, and so they point out the highlights what have happened in the last week. So that keeps them tied in too. But uh, I, guess, I guess my image of my hair on fire and my Irish roots probably had something to do with um, why I started knocking on doors. I, and so I'm a member of Sierra Club. That helped me get tied in. Um, I went to Des Moines to the, uh, the hearing there, and that was, uh, that was very good, hearing uh, the stories of the landowners that were affected. And there were a lot of sh tears shed that day and uh, a lot of similar sentiments from people. So. Um, yes, as has been pointed out um, by Brian, we have the numbers. And with the numbers, uh, we have found that we are mostly against, especially eminent domain, because that's where the, really the rubber hits the road. Eminent domain is just something that many of us can't tolerate. Just uh, if you don't volunteer to sign, we'll just take it away from you. It's all right. Well, um, that's been my experience. Thank you. Um, what you said about the rural communities is something that, you know, a lot of these pipeline companies actually use to their advantage. They use to the advantage that they think rural folks are all isolated and on their individual farm and ranch so they can tell one person one thing to maybe appease their concerns and then say something completely different to the next neighbor or offer one landowner $10,000 and another one that they think is gonna put more of a fight up, maybe we'll offer them $50,000 to see if we can get them to sign so they don't kind of organize others. So uh, the next question I wanted to ask, and I'm only gonna ask this one last question and then I'm gonna have questions from the audience and then Brian's gonna come up to finish us off. Um, is can you describe some of the tactics that the pipeline companies used against you when they were trying to get you to sign an easement or when you went to hearings? Just like because what I've noticed as I travel around different states, it's a, it's a playbook that they have. <laughs> and it is consistent uh, state after state after state. So sometimes I think it's good if we talk about those so people don't feel like they're you know, alone. Come in and it's still not working. Does one do? Try that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you can't figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> we have to hold it? I don't think so. Okay. They'll come and they, they tell you that they want you to sign. They'll change the figures while they're there. They'll offer you a little bit to start with and they'll change it, try to get you to sign, and then you still tell them no. And I've had a lot of neighbors tell me, at the end, then they threaten them. If they won't sign, they say, well, we're just going to take you to court. Try to do that. I had one farmer call and tell me, he told them no, 
they went to his next door neighbor and actually lied to the neighbor and told him that the previous farmer had signed and was on board 100% and they should sign too. And if he had to call the neighbor to check to prove they were lying, he may have signed, but because he did, and he knew they were lying, and he threw them off too. So they're constantly doing those types of things and intimidating people. That's how they do it. Um, or they'll scare you and they'll tell you, well, you just as well sign because it's going to go through anyhow. So they use those sort of tactics. But in regards to that, I have testified at the PUC hearing that it baffles me, why would anyone even consider signing an easement with a company that doesn't have a permit yet? They don't have a permit, why would you sign? Until they get that permit, there's no advantage for you to sign, in my opinion, and why would you give away your easement forever if they don't even have approval yet. And I've used the example that if I threw money around like that before I knew what was actually going to happen, if I did that in my farming operation, I'd have been out of business a long time ago. Now maybe they can do that because they've got an oil baron behind them that kicked in $250 million here about a month ago up in North Dakota and when he announced it. That's one of the guys that's trying to push this through. His name is Harold Hamm from Continental Resources. That's one of the investors we know about. Maybe they can do that, but I sure couldn't uh, conduct business that way. But yeah, their intimidation factors, the lies. Some guys, they go to and they'll give them an offer and they'll turn them down and then they'll get a phone call the next day. Well, name your price. Tell us what it'll take to get you to sign. And what we found is in our areas, they'll go around to each county or a township in the county and they'll pick off somebody that they think is the most well-respected person in that area and they'll try to really work them and get them on board first because then they think they can use them to influence and get everybody else around. But up where I'm at, it's not working. Nobody's buying it. Nobody's falling for it. I, would, I don't know any statistics in South Dakota, but I'm just telling you folks, I don't think they've got 15% if they've even got that to sign willingly. Um, everybody is just understanding that there's no option. And the other thing that's got people not signing, and this is very important, people have been checking with their liability insurance covers, finding out that there's an, I haven't found an insurance company yet up in our area that's gonna cover us farmers for the liability on this thing. If you hit that line and it breaks, it's all gonna come back on us. My niece is the, for our local bank, she's the insurance rep, and she has three companies that she writes for. They've all signed on as interveners for our PUC hearing in South Dakota because the companies are actually going to testify to that. That they will not underwrite a liability policy for the farmers. I was just going to get back to one more example quickly on the getting involved. Back in January of this year, you know, I'm, I'm just a farmer too. You know, I didn't ask for this fight. I don't think any of you folks asked for the Keystone fight either. Just the important thing to remember is these companies are doing it to us. We didn't ask to be put in this position. I was out doing my chores, feeding the cattle in January of this year one day, and I heard the Summit people were on our local radio station in Aberdeen telling how great this was. And it made me so angry when I got done, I went in the house and I called the radio station and told them, I said, you guys, you don't know, you don't understand what it's like out here in the country. I said, the people don't want this. I said, you're going to ruin your reputation by putting people like that on. You know where it got me? It got me a half hour interview the next day over noon hour on the radio station <laughs> to give our side, which wouldn't have happened if I hadn't called up and complained. And since that time, we've, I've been on four or five times different places, which is good. So don't be afraid to speak up. Don't let them intimidate you. And get on your media if they're given their line, if they're, they're baloney. You know, get on your media, respond. That's the thing. Just keep responding. But as far as the easements, you can't trust anything. I'm, in, I'm talking about Summit. That's who I'm involved with, but I'm sure it's similar on all the rest. I know Keystone. In fact, Keystone's involved in South Dakota, I gotta tell you folks. We tried to lobby our legislature to pass an eminent domain protection for us in South Dakota this past legislative session. 
we had legislators that I met with and then one other landowner in December before the session started in Aberdeen. We met with seven or eight of them. And they talked about doing some eminent domain legislation. We have no protection in South Dakota on eminent domain. I think we're probably the worst state. We got assurances from several of those that they would look into it and put their name on it and do something. So we go into session in January. You know what happened? You know who showed up in committee to testify against this? The lobbyists for Summit. And of course, here's the lobbyists for Keystone coming in on this issue. And our legislators caved. They took the word of the two lobbyists against our own citizens. And so we have no protection yet on eminent domain issues in South Dakota. And one more point I want to point out. You know who the law firm that Summit has employed in South Dakota to represent them? It's the same law firm that Keystone used on, on the Trans Canada, or that Trans Canada used on Keystone 1, the same one on Keystone XL, and the same one on Dakota Access. They're now representing Summit on this pipeline. So they are not representing the interests of our citizens. Okay, all right, there we go. It's on, I don't have to holler. <laughs> so I, I, I didn't think I really said, said what I, what organization I represent. I, I represent the Indigenous Environmental Network. I am the national pipelines organizer for IEN. So I get to fight all kinds of pipelines all over the country and in so-called Canada and all across Turtle Island. And so you're, you guys are we're dealing with Summit Pipeline, Carbon's Pipeline right now. And, and before that, we dealt with tar sands. I've got to deal with frack pipelines. I deal with all kinds. But Carbon Pipelines are something unique because they come in and they're going to try to say well, they're, what they're doing is they're greenwashing. Carbon offsets, carbon sequestration, carbon, um, all of these, these things around carbon are all false solutions. Now there are zero CYP lands, and we've, we've used that for a very long time here in the Midwest. There's a use for that, and there's a reason why we do that here in the Midwest, and it's, it's very strong here in our agricultural communities, and it helps us to protect our soil. But what they're doing is they're telling these people in California, they're telling these people in Washington, they're telling these people in DC, let's offset the use of your fossil fuels by building up these carbons and carbon pipelines, taking it up to North Dakota, potentially Wyoming, and then injecting it into old fracking wells that can cause more devastation right there. And one of the places that they want to do this is where they actually stored some of the Keystone One tar sands um, pollution right next to it. So let's frack right next to where they put all this tar sands pollution that spills over there and in, up there in South Dakota. And let's um, cause some earthquakes and see what else happens. See, they don't care. They don't care. They don't care about what happens to us out here in the Midwest. They sure as heck don't care about what happens to us as indigenous people. But whatever they do to us as indigenous people, they're going to end up doing to the rest of the world. And we saw that happening. What they did to us at Standing Rock, they did in Minnesota, they did here in Nebraska, they did down Kansas, they're doing it in, in Texas, they're passing these anti-protest laws, taking away our right to, to, to taking our, away our right to have freedom of speech and to peacefully protest. It doesn't say protest, it says peacefully protest. That First Amendment says peacefully protest. But they're taking that away from us. That's not right. That's not American. That's not who 
we are? So think about those things. <coughs> things that they've done. Things that they've done. My house has been shot up over 30 times by TransCanada's goons. Shot up. I've been chased off of roads. I got COPD. But I, I, I was also an intervener in the Keystone XL fight. I tried to be an intervener in the, in the Summit Bay Lake fight. But they passed a new law in 2019 specifically targeted to avoid uh, tribes and tribal people from, from becoming interveners in the state of South Dakota. The state of South Dakota is probably the most racist state in the Union. Yes. Yes. It's even more racist than North Dakota. It's more racist than in Wyoming because they, they, they actively seek out and build laws against tribal people and against the alliances that we built across the board. That's okay. They can make me not an intervener. All they did is free me up to do what I do best. <laughs> but um, for those that want to learn about, about the full solutions of carbon offsets and carbon pricing and carbon sequestration, I'm more than happy to discuss that. Um, I've got some booklets with me that can talk about that. You can look online at Hoodwink in the Hot House. There's a webinar series, series that I am as part of. Um, and, and we talk a lot about how how these oil companies um, build these out, build these carbon offsets, so that these there's really a whole false market that's being developed right now that only help mine oil companies' pockets and CEOs. It doesn't help us, and it doesn't do dang anything for the environment. It doesn't do nothing for the environment, but allows polluters to continue to pollute and to continue to target BIPOC communities and to continue to target rural America so that we can become the stepping stone, the doormat, so that they can feel good about themselves. And I'm not going to put up with it. That's not who we are. <clears throat> well, I had the great pleasure working with two different TransCanada agents. I don't remember the, the first guy's name, he was a younger guy, kind of a nice fella. Jeff Ralph. Probably could be. Yeah. Anyhow, uh, he was around for a few months, but when he wasn't getting anywhere, they brought in the big hammer, Dan. Dan the man, I call him. <laughs> now, Dan had one mission in life. And that was to make my life as miserable as he possibly could. And he did a pretty damn good job of it. <clears throat> but by the same token, my mission in life was to make his life and his job as hard and miserable as possible. And I think I did a pretty damn good job of that too. So Dan told me a lot of things. And you have to excuse my language on this one. But Dan one day said, Randy, I don't understand you. Why are you not signing up? All your neighbors are signed up. He said, you realize you're the last person in my whole district to sign up? And I said, good, Dan, because I plan on being the last son of a bitch in the state of Nebraska. <laughs> and then, of course, you know, they tell you, well, Randy, we're offering you $9,000 to come across your property to use your land the rest of your life and your grandkids' life. And that's all we're going to pay. You're never going to get another dime. Well, guess what? You know, a few months later, it's 18000 which is still a ridiculously small amount of money. It's never about the money anyhow. And that's what we told them. You know, and Dan... He told me a lot of lies, but he did tell me one thing that was true. I believed it. One day he said, Randy, I gotta tell you, you're never gonna win this fight. 
because all the higher ups in Lincoln are in favor of it. He was absolutely right because 99% of our elected officials in the state of Nebraska, from the city councils to the county commissioners, to the legislature and to the governor, were all in favor of it. So I had no reason not to believe him because I knew that was true. But it also did one other thing to me. It made me all that much more determined to do whatever I could to stop this damn thing. And as you, maybe you can tell, I'm a little bit passionate sometimes, especially when it comes to things like this. But even with my fierce determination to stop it, I can guarantee you, if I wouldn't have found these people in this room, I would not stood a chance. Because you cannot defeat these people by yourself. And it takes thousands of people to support it. And we were fortunate to have that happen. People came out of the woodwork. I couldn't believe it. I mean, they weren't landowners. They were from Omaha, Lincoln, and all over. But they believed in what we were doing. And that was the whole difference. You know, it, their strategy really is kind of the same strategy that four-legged predators have used for thousands of years. They look for a stray, somebody off by themselves, or they peel somebody off the herd, because they're easy to take down when they're by themselves. So my advice to you today is don't be a stray. Get in the herd, stay in the herd, because you've got some of the, the best pipeline fighters in the world right here knowledgeable people and they can definitely help you but you need to do your part too you know sometimes just having a lot of people in attendance can make the difference you go down to a hearing in the legislature and there's two people that are opposing something what are the senators going to think about that so it's important to have if nothing else, you don't want to do anything else, show up, be there, be counted, and I hope you will. Thank you very much. And yeah, uh, everything these guys are saying, we've experienced it. We've experienced this type of activity. I always called their land agents the best dang salespersons in the world. They love you to death and, oh, you know, just try to bend over backwards and like they say one day they make you an offer and they'll call you up and say well we could go a little higher we could go a little higher you know but can we come talk and the answer was always no hell no I said you give me a million dollars you're not going to get me to sign I says this is there are principles here you know you start with the property rights all the way up through uh, you know how bad tar sands are, etc. That's a whole other discussion. But you know, these land agents. One of them. One of them found out that, or so he said, that he and I go to the same denomination of church. <laughs> and so you know, I'd run into him every so often. I didn't seek him out, but he would seek me out, and uh, he would uh, he would say well you know he'd start using the church angle because I was a church council president he claimed he was too and uh, you know I really questioned whether we actually you know his values and my values didn't belong to the same church uh, but that's another another story too uh, one of the things that just made me so angry was one of the land agents visited my elderly neighbors World War II vet and going a little bit senile. My neighbor, uh, after church one Sunday morning, came up to me and he says, did you get a big check from that pipeline company? And I said, why no, did you get one? 
yeah, I got this check. I don't know why I got a check. I have no idea why I got a check. I says, did you sign something? No, I didn't sign anything. And I looked at his wife and I said, did you sign anything? She says, I don't know, we may have. You know, and uh, her children are, are just matter of heck about that. But I mean, you know, they take advantage of people. Any avenue they can. I mean, I don't know how that land agent was able to sleep at night after doing that to these people. That's the kind of caliber that they are. They are not your friends. They're not going to make you happy. And, you know, they, they're, they're not good. Well, I shouldn't say they're not good people because they might very well be. They're doing their job. But I don't know how anyone could live with doing a job like the job they have to do or expected to do. So, so that's just something to warn you about. Um, I, I want to reiterate what Jane said is there's a playbook and it is definitely a playbook. Playbook starts with a little spattering of money. $9,000 must be the magic number <laughs> because we just got something from, con <laughs> con uh, car from Summit and guess what the amount is? Nine thousand really? dollars, at the same as what Keystone was at the height. We were offered as much as two hundred and ninety thousand. So don't settle for that first one. You know they always have more money, even though everyone's the last offer. So you don't settle for that. But when that doesn't work, then they throw money elsewhere. They'll throw money at county commissioners. We had a county commissioner, and through vigilance in our county, one of our researchers found out that they had taken money from TransCanada and hadn't disclosed it to um, conflict of interest. And they had to recuse themselves after a year and a half of decision making already. So they go to the county commissioners. If that doesn't work, they go elsewhere in town. We had an administrator that would call me and, you know, I'm just a little bitty peg in all this, but this administrator decided I kind of kept track. So he'd call me every time something happened and he'd want to be updated. So when TransCanada went to the schools and said, what can we buy for you? He said, I don't want anything from you, which was amazing because little bitty people resisting. He wasn't on the route, but he also didn't want dirty money. Um, so, yeah, Public Service Commission, if any of you sat through the week-long Public Service Commission and listened to the argument Domino Law put for us, it was remarkable. And no sane, um, moral person would have voted for this, but we lost at that level. So even at the state level, the best uh, legal service we could possibly get, we lost. However, at the Zoning Commission in Holt County, we had a zoning commission of neighbors that had integrity. And with guidance from Donna Law Firm, they knew places to resist. And our zoning board was always vigilant. So even if you can't win at the state level, if you can win at the local level, you don't take money for the school and you don't take money for the fire department. And you say, no, we don't want you in our county. Um, maybe that's the best place to fight because we know our neighbors and we uh, the, and they know us, and so honesty maybe exists at that level and it doesn't at higher levels. So I would say stay active, uh, even at the local level. I'm passing it to my husband. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, yeah, stay active. I'm on the zoning board, and we went, me and Art was down to commissioner's meeting, and I was down there to complain about roads, and the Trans Canada was there to talk the road hall agreements. Our commissioners told us, I complained about roads that they couldn't take care of our roads that I was talking about until another two or three years because they were concerned about TransCanada's roads. Because TransCanada had the money. They were giving us, the county, a ton of money, a couple million dollars. So what's gonna look forward to? Your money? or your citizens. County board takes money. And it's the same with the zoning board. Our zoning board, Hope County is active. I'd say very active. In fact, they're super active. Antelope County, we have zero regulations on this pipeline. I went to the meeting the other day and told them we gotta get some regulations. One guy says, oh, it's all federally regulated. No, it's not, people. 
You've got to get to the, your meetings and find out things. That's the major thing. Get educated. Your county and local ordinances are not there. You think it is, do you think they'll look for you too? They won't. <coughs> not unless they're very active. And it is, you've got to speak up. One person down knows another one. So if you go and go to your commissioners and stuff, or zoning board meetings, maybe you'll get another person there. Pretty soon another one's gonna come. We're all in it together. And that's what we gotta do is fight together, not individually. And uh, the CO2 line is a half mile, I seen on my map the other day I got, is a half mile from the town of Orchard. Now they ain't gonna advertise that. Nope, it's a half mile. They don't care. And you ask, why does it follow the railroad? Because the ethanol plants are all along the railroads mostly. How come it doesn't follow them? Think about that. Because the railroad goes through every town. They don't want to deal with the public that doesn't have anything to do with it. They want the individual person. They don't want groups. They want individuals. Um, I have had only phone contact from Navigator, um, so I have not had to deal face to face with a surveyor or a land agent. Um, I talked to the surveyor on the phone and he, uh, after I received my restricted certified letter to notify me that they would be out, um, he called and, uh, and said that yes, they would be, in a couple of weeks, they would be out to the farm. Um, I think I think that the pipeline has changed their path in our neighborhood, and uh, they've notified verbally my neighbor that they will not be going through through her property. So it moved over. So hopefully they'll miss me. But um, um, I'm not sure. Uh, had another point. They they do practice their marketing very well, you know, very stringently. Um, oh, and by the way, I told that surveyor, I may have no ability to tell you that you can't come on, the, on my farm, but I said, I'm not gonna open the gate for you. You're gonna have to climb through the fence, I guess. So that's probably what they did. Um, oh, but in talking to a family person, in an, uh, another part of Woodbury County, um, you know, she said, well, that somebody came out to the farm and they were very nice. I said, of course they were very nice. You know, they want, they want to convince you. Um, so, you know, I had to tell her about that. And uh, I had another example, but it got away, so. <laughs> it might come back. Oh. I got one more. <laughs> okay, when they come to survey my ground, and uh, after they eminent domain me and stuff, they come and there was 10 vehicles there parked along the road. I was in my pasture, and uh, they were sitting there, and uh, I put up electric fence along the four-wire fence about a foot away so that they had to crawl underneath the fence like the stinks they were. They come and stuff and they come up and I went up to the first guy and he, I says, I need a form of an ID. He showed me his keystone badge and I says, I need more than that. He says, I don't have any other. And I asked him, I said, then how did you drive here? He turned around and walked away. The next guy comes up and I asked him the same thing. He shows me a badge his Keystone badge, and then I asked for more ID, and he says he didn't have it. Same thing. The next one was a college kid, I guess, because he was awful young, and he comes up to me and he says, I don't have a Keystone badge, but I got a driver's license, and he whipped <laughs> it out and showed me. 
They all left. Well, I sat there and I was talking to Art on the phone. He was up there in the intersection. And I said, I wonder what's happening. Well, pretty soon here come a deputy sheriff from the north. And he sat there and he talked to Art a little bit and they kept waiting. Pretty soon our local county sheriff showed up. And then him and the deputy come walking towards me over in my pasture. And I told him, I said, you're trespassing because I still own ground on the other side of that fence. And the deputy, he just, wow, he come unglued. He thought he was SOL. But uh, anyway, he says, we're here to protect TransCanada from you. And I said, what? And he says, we're here to protect TransCanada from you. They can be on your ground. And I says, no, they can't. They can be on their so-called easement ground. Well, the surveyors come sliding underneath the fence again, and they were standing there with their tripods and stuff and whatnot, and the one guy stepped south about four foot, and I told the sheriff, I said, you see that? I said, I think he was standing on my ground. He says, I'm here to protect TransCanada from you. Well, it gets better. They went across, and then they crossed my north fence line, and then they started walking along that fence line. And I knew then they were exactly on my ground. And I told the sheriff, I said, go down and get their names. They're trespassing. He said, I'm here to protect you, TransCanada, from you. I said, if you're not going down there, send the deputy down there. Then. Nope. And pretty soon, he started reaching in my Suburban for the keys. Well. I gave him a shove, shut my door, and drove over towards him as far as I could get close to him till the terrain was bad and stuff. Well, he come running down there and he told me, you do that again, I'll arrest you. And I told him, I said, you and whose army? Well, he says, well, Joe Abler's coming up, the county attorney, to show us the papers. Well. It took a half hour for Joe to show up again, you know, and uh, then he told me to come over there, and I told him, well, have Joe come over to me. He said, that ain't going to happen. Well, it didn't happen. So I had to drive a mile down to the gate, then over 300 yards, and then a mile back. You know how long that takes? About a half hour, 45 minutes. I was in no hurry. I get down there, and... <laughs> Sheriff tells me to come over to Joe's pickup. I said, have him come over to me. I'm handicapped. Didn't happen. He hands me the paper. And I asked the county attorney. I says, say, can we do, how are we supposed to get these guys for trans, uh, trespassing if I can't get their names? He said, what do you mean? I says, I told the sheriff to get their names when they're trespassing, and they didn't. He said, well, do you have legal counsel? And I told him, I said, it sure as a blank wasn't be you. That's, that's the way. The next day, they were coming back to survey the neighbor's ground across the road. Well, this time, there was only nine vehicles. So I drove down there. They had gotten out of their vehicles and got their equipment ready. And the one guy was standing on my side of the ditch and when I drove by, he recognized me. He scuttled right across after I passed. And I drove down to the intersection and parked. I'm 300 yards away from him. They sat there and they didn't do anything more. They sat there. I sat there for a half hour and they didn't do anything. And I told Art, called up Art and told him. And I said, well, I must have moved up in the law enforcement because a patrolman pulled up. It was a patrol car. Well, when the officer got out, I said, no, Art, it's not state patrol. It's the county mounting because he didn't put his patrol hat on. And they, he sat down there and talked to them for a while, and then he walked up to me. And I was parked on my side of the road in the ditch and stuff and whatnot. And I asked him, he said, roll down your window. Finally, I rolled down the window and said, what? And he says, is there something wrong? And he says, 
no. I says, was there something wrong with me parking on my side of the ground and my property? No, I'm here to protect Trans Canada from you. And I said, what? And he repeated it. And he sat down there next to me while they did there for three hours. I didn't talk to him. I didn't need to. That's the operation they have. They'll work on anything but for you. They'll get the government, uh, your county officials, law enforcement, if they can, to be against you people. So, bound together, Brian, Jane, join us. You'll win. That's what I've got to say. Thank you, panelists. I'm going to throw the, yeah, to Brian and then we'll get any questions. I think people have heard mostly about the Eastman Action Team, Brian, but I thought you could just briefly <coughs> describe it uh, and then we can, because I know it's getting late, getting in, in, ugh, any questions answered. Yeah, well, great. Well, it's good to go last because you've heard um, so many of the stories and so many of the experiences that have uh, really formed and were foundational of the easement team and the group, the landowner group that we uh, put together. And it's great to see uh, a, a lot of our clients and friends here that we battled 12 years together. Um, you know, hearing some of these stories again, even though I, I live them, uh, most of them with these fine folks, it just is making me pretty angry, quite frankly, um, and um, upset because you folks are no doubt going to have to deal with a lot of these same things and all of us have a voice and all of us have rights but if we don't exercise either they are just trampled on and you may be sitting in the audience thinking you know i don't know if i really want to be maybe as outspoken as some of these folks or i just want to farm or ranch and that's totally fine and the reason that we created the group nebraska easement action team and now others across the states as you can see here specifically for the summit navigator these co2 pipelines is because of the fact as they have said you can't do this alone even if you wanted to do it alone you can't do it alone and even if you want to be a part of it but you think to yourself well well i don't want to stand up and speak or i don't really want to be confrontational if i don't have to that's okay because by joining the group, you benefit from all of the actions, all of the activities, the entire network of everyone involved. And so we created this along with landowners after the resistance to TransCanada had been growing because we realized in a statewide opposition, you have to have glue to kind of keep people together. You have to have a structure, right? And so that's where the easement team was born, to provide that structure to keep people educated, informed, where you're getting the same information. Someone from Northeast Nebraska is sharing with people from Southeast Nebraska. You're not getting told one story here. They, oh, everyone in the county has signed up except for you. And it's like, well, is that true or not? And we know that's not true. And one of the really exciting things for me, which I tell all of my folks, we do weekly Zooms for every state, video conference for people who want to uh, participate, is that this is the first time ever on a major pipeline infrastructure eminent domain project where you have coordination on multiple states, all of the states involved. It was a big enough deal back in TransCanada where Nebraska was really the lone holdouts with landowners that were just saying no and it was the last state in a multi-state battle. Um, and when we got started, we only had 10%, approximately 10% of the land they needed was not already signed up through the quote unquote voluntarily, voluntary easements. And then over 12 years of the resistance, the landowners exercising their rights, their voice through the easement team and actions on their own, we were able to be successful. And so I'm not gonna stand up here and predict and tell you what the future holds uh, in terms of victory, success, whatever that might look like. But I will tell you that you are going to be dealing with the same frustrations, sleepless nights, agony, that these folks and their family members and elderly relatives, parents had to deal with. And that's not right and that's not fair. And so. The easement team is, is very simply 
We're stronger together than we are divided or one by one, and there's power in numbers. And then the practical side is, imagine how much money these companies are throwing around. These are expensive fights, and I don't care how successful of a farmer or landowner you are, you can't afford to fight it on your own. None of these folks could afford to fight it on their own. But when we band together 100 families, 200 families, and then divide the cost, divide the expense of all of the efforts and what we're doing, the legal work and those efforts on a pro rata share, it is affordable. And that's the only possible way you can do it. Now I'll tell you, there's a lot more profitable things I can be doing um, than this kind of work, but it's after 12 years and the, and the friendships uh, that we've forged. Um, my parents from North Dakota have grown up here in Nebraska, you know, work with a lot of farmers, ranchers. It's in my heart, it's in my blood. And, and I like to do this work because you can make a real difference and a real impact in real people's lives who otherwise, frankly, would be trampled on and just a number, which is all you are on their giant spreadsheets. Uh, and that's not right, and that's not how you all deserve to be treated, and we're not gonna stand for it. But the work we do, is only as powerful and possible for the landowners who stand up and want to be involved. If I don't have people like these folks, you know, willing to fight and willing to be there and at least show up, stand up, then there's very little we can do. And so uh, it takes all of us and um, I encourage all of you to join up, get more information. And even if you think everything you heard here today makes no sense, I don't believe any of it, it's all fake news. If you don't believe anything that we've said, at least do this. Don't sign the easements, okay? Wait, you heard, at the very least, the prices go up, right? At the very least, if your only concern is economics, wait. There aren't final approvals, there aren't final permits. This is a multi-state pipeline that is dependent on each state falling in line, okay? That's why we have such an opportunity because a success in any one of the states is a domino effect for the other states and so if we can stay together on a state-by-state -state basis and then intrastate we have a real chance to affect real change here uh, and at the very least at the end of this if say all the fix is in it with all the elected officials and this is going to happen no matter what at the very least let's stick together then to negotiate as a block on the protections that are in that easement contract so you and your family and your legacy and your economic interest and your land and your rights are protected. So that's the high level uh, pitch. You've been here for a little while, uh, but frankly, these folks said it best. They lived it. They're here in the communities. They're landowners just like you. And uh, you, know, you can take their, their word as accurate. And I, I, I unfortunately and fortunately experienced those same stories uh, with them. And so we'd appreciate it if you all joined together uh, because at the end of the day, again, if we're not in this together, it's, it's, there's just little chance of success in protecting your ground. So I, I'll answer any questions at all, but uh, again, I think you kind of have the gist of it, so I don't believe I need to go on and on on the concept. Yes, ma'am. I have a question. Have all these people been um, members then of the action team for their state? They've all signed up with you and figured out that. Uh, yes, these are, well, yes, uh, um, Ed in South Dakota, so that's current, and then the other folks uh, were TransCanada folks, but then now they're also, I think Jeannie has Summit affecting you potentially yeah. too. Yeah. As of yesterday. As of yeah. yesterday, yeah. So this is only for Summit, not, this wasn't for the pipeline, the XL pipeline. Well, okay, so how we, this all got started 10 years ago? was because it was the Keystone XL pipeline. So that brought us all together. But now, Summit, Navigator are also affecting some of the same rural lands of these same folks, our clients. Okay, because yeah. my question is, as I read this, knowing that we would pay to be involved in this and pay you as an attorney to help buy for us, I know you can't give us an exact amount, but is there, at some point, if you've been buying this for 10 years on XL, I can only imagine that these would be huge, even if you divide it by 100 or 200. And that's my question. How, how can we? That is not the case. Okay. It is the best bang for the buck. It's less than you'd pay for coffee if you're a coffee drinker. It was the best piece of economy. Not only did Brian do all the legal work, he held our hands through the most crisis-filled time. 
we would have been fools not to do it. I, I just want to say one other thing. TransCanada also tried to buy our loans, and you probably don't have any debt. We do have a little debt. And so TransCanada tried to buy our loans, and we, so we had to be in touch with our banker, and she said, we will never do that, but they tried. They also condemned whole sections when all we knew was a quarter was condemned. So we had to know what was going on in the courthouse. Brian was always there. I mean, I could sleep because Brian was there, and it was the best bang for the buck. He probably won't tell you that, but it's true. Speaking of which, on TransCanada, I had just one acre that they were going to take, you know, easily. So it doesn't matter how big you are, we're treated equal. Brian and them treated us all equal. So it doesn't make how much ground you have or how much ground that summit or those pipelines cross it. It's how you're going to be treated. Fair That's the thing with me. So, we, so were, we were all treated fairly price wise, I guess that's what I'm hearing from you is that we were all treated fairly like, you know, an X amount of dollars everybody kind of pays the same amount. Is that a way to say yeah, it? Yeah, that's fair. And, but I mean getting to your to your question, can can I predict what it's gonna cost? No, I cannot. And but it's once you make the decision that you wanna do something, you you can hire maybe someone to do it just for you and you pay hundred percent of the freight. Or for instance, if there's a hundred, there's over a hundred families in Iowa, there's over a hundred families in South Dakota, and, and so it's it's a small fraction. I think the, the bill that we was sent out um, was like five hundred and some dollars or something, a little over five hundred dollars, which I mean it would have been tens of tens of thousands, obviously, if it was just you alone. And so I wish I could control the cost, but we are also reacting to what they are doing. Um, and we try to be strategic. We certainly can't do every possible thing, but in consultation with the landowners, what are the most strategic things? What are the places we can make the most impact? Um, and then we do the work and divide the cost. Can we give a number? I don't even remember what, right now. For us, I would say it's about $4,000 for 10 or 12 years yeah. complete, and we got money back at the end of it. That was the, we got a check, did you know that? Yeah, of course I, of course I know that. <laughs> the reason I ask is because, you know, we have attorneys that charge us four or $500 an hour, okay? So all I'm thinking of is if this goes on for 10 years, I'm thinking of 250, 300, and 400,000 no. yeah. dollars. About 4,000, 4,500 well, maybe. And, and yeah. I, I, it's, it's kind of like, you know, um, past, past <laughs> results may not be indicative of the future. But it wasn't a hundred that is, is yeah. what we're getting at it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And I can give you another good example. Um, Trans Canada kind of messed with the landowners in Antelope County, and we have a law here in Nebraska. If you file eminent domain and so forth, and and uh, you know you give give the easement back or the eminent domain back, uh, then they're responsible for paying the uh, legal fees and so forth. Uh, we ended up taking, well, it kind of, I don't want to get into all the details, but basically uh, that spurred off another case which went to the Nebraska Supreme Court. And because we ended up winning that case, uh, like uh, Bob and Bev and myself and the other 26 people that were involved in that in our county, we did not pay a dime on that. So, you know, there are times when the pipeline company foots the bill. Plus you're buying intimidation. I mean, when you say your attorney is Domino Law Firm and, and Brian Jordy, they go, oh. Yeah. So there's a little bit of intimidation yeah. you get with, yeah. with that. Well, I mean, it, there's lots of benefits. I mean, the first thing really is if you don't want to be harassed, harassed day after day when the land agents come into your yard, if you are represented by counsel, whether it's me or anyone else, they ethically cannot contact you directly anymore. So some people right out of the gate said that's enough uh, for me to want to be in because I'm sick of these harassing phone calls. But there's obviously lots of benefits. When we started uh, looking for legal counsel here in South Dakota, and when we first talked to Brian, we thought, well, maybe we'll get 40 sign up in South Dakota. We'd have to get at least that to make it work. 
as of last Tuesday, Brian, I think you said you had 102. It's, it's more than yeah, it's it's more. Than more. That. Yeah. And I can tell you from experience, I've had two people that have signed on with him that went to their own attorney in Aberdeen, two different attorneys, and asked for their recommendation. And when they checked out that law firm, Brian's law firm, they told their clients, you better get signed up with him. If you want the best, something, we can't do the work that they're going to do for you. And my response is, I have the same questions from people, gee, are we going to want to do this? How much is it going to cost us? And I asked people, I said, well, folks, stop and think, how much is your farm worth to you? How much is your land worth to you to keep what you've got? And to me, yeah, I don't want to spend any more money than I have to, but I work too hard to build what I've got to give it away to some greedy private individual who operates out of Ames, Iowa. I don't want to pick on Iowa. But if you've researched this man that's behind this, folks, I know this is a strong word, but I think the guy's evil. He's got a history to him. If you've seen what he's tried to do a few years ago over in Tanzania, Africa, have you seen the story about that? He tried to take 800,000 acres of land in Tanzania away from 162,000 of their immigrant residents, offering them 22 cents an acre. And he hauled the prime minister and the government officials of that country at his own expense out to Ames and tried to offer them money to get the job done. And it fell through. How many of us with our own personal attorney and our own, on our own are going to be able to stand up to somebody like that. I guess I call the guy a mercenary. And if I'm going to fight a mercenary, I want somebody that knows what they're doing and has been involved before. And we're not dealing with decent people here on this Summit Carbon Solutions thing. I'm telling you folks. The other thing is, uh, quickly, they, uh, he's got a huge corporate helicopter here about a week ago, they were flying over us in South Dakota with this great big, and it's not a small helicopter, it's one of these like army transport ones, so I don't know how many people he was hauling. And they were flying low enough to where we could see Summit on the side of it. And I know they were going all up and down the line and they were going over people's farms and a couple people even had their cattle scared by it, that's how low they were. So they're checking us out and, and uh, keeping an eye on us and, and flying the route. So, I don't care what, I, I, I do care what my bill is going to be, but I want the best and I'm, and I, 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 South Dakota people have been convinced of that, that we've got the best. Like I said, we went from hoping to get 40 and we're way over 100 right now. And I think what you've got more than that in Iowa. So don't be afraid to sign up with Domino Law Firm. Are there other questions? Yeah, Shelly. Uh, Brian, you're on the call uh, Wednesday nights before the Iowa Sierra Club call. I'm on the Sierra Club call. Yep. The one who lives in Iowa, but I have parents here. Right, right. So, are you gonna? Are you? Are you having separate state Zoom calls eventually, or is it one Zoom call? And what are you gonna be doing there? Well, we, yeah. So every Tuesday at 5:30 is South Dakota, and then Wednesday 6 is the Iowa. And you know, Nebraska is a little quirky because we don't have a state process here like the PSC in North Dakota, PUC, right. IUB. And so the Nebraska, it's a little slow to generate, mainly because there isn't a deadline, right? right. And so, but the answer to your question is, since each state is, is different and there's different legal strategies and things, we're doing state specific. And then we did that one Iowa, South Dakota, all person, and we'll have some calls like that. So when we're preparing certain aspects of it, we'll invite everybody. To the calls. Because it would help to get all the Nebraska people together as well. Yeah. Who's, who's going with you? Because I think it just gets us all to the one the, the Sierra call I'm on. I, I probably should be on the Iowa legal call because I, you know, I'm on your team in Nebraska. But right. I'm trying to get people you know signed up here in Nebraska to your team because I think it's so important to, to gain up on this guy that that you were talking about. I know all about him, unfortunately. So it's just a, a, big, a big, it's great to do that, but I think it just brings people together. Um, and these calls are great. So if you have an opportunity to go on any of these Zoom calls, please do so because there's so many things that are talked about 
you know, whether it's the legal information, whether it's what's going on in the county. I, there's just so much information. And then I know that when you get done with your call, here comes all these people coming on the, on the Sierra Club call because they all came from your call. Right. And they just start talking about what's going on and, and what's happening. And so it's really a it's big community. And so yep. it's really great to have that. And I know another reason I ask is when you do start that, I got to train my parents on how to do Zoom. <laughs> yeah, yep. lots of Zoom. But it's great to use that technology because it would be impossible to drive around and have us all get together, you know. And then we record those calls, so if you have, you're busy, then you can watch it and you're never behind, so. So we will hold a Nebraska one eventually, just to like put an exclamation point. Iowa and South Dakota are further along in their numbers process because they have the regulatory where there were deadlines to file your paperwork for interveners. And so Brian's team in the local groups on the ground, Sierra Club in Iowa, the Dakota Rural Action in South Dakota, uh, that's where a lot of the focus has been. And so in Nebraska, I think there's already 30 people signed up for the Nebraska Eastern Action Team, but we want to get that to at least 100. Um, so the more, I think some people are waiting because they're not sure like what exactly is happening in Nebraska, right. that, that because we don't have happen. those same uh, process that has happened in Iowa and South Dakota, they had that they were required by their state law, which we don't have in Nebraska, for these pipeline companies to hold formal meetings in each of these counties. And so landowners were all able to hear from each other, very similar to how we did with Keystone. We were able to hear from each other, hear concerns, people signed up. So we are in this weird space in Nebraska where we're trying to make sure that everybody knows that yes, this pipeline's coming and no, you don't have to sign. In fact, in Nebraska, there's really no pressure to sign because they have no regulatory process and there's lots of legal strategies, which we won't say in public, so we're not giving away the playbook, but there's lots of legal strategies we can deploy in Nebraska that we can't in Iowa and South Dakota um, because there is no law, so there's no due process, so we'll be able to deploy a lot of legal strategies. Because okay. I just know a lot of people are anxious yes. about, you know, what's, how we can we start, are we, are we together, what's happening? So I'll talk to Brian about getting a call with the folks that have already signed yeah, up. Yeah, that might be helpful. Yeah, that would help people know that that should be. And then we have, yeah, <laughs> yeah. he's not doing anything. I know we, what he's doing in Iowa and South Yeah, no, exactly. On all those, on those different Tom and I will go back on the road doing meetings um, across in different towns that are impacted. And then on the Nebraska easement site, we have the past virtual meetings we've held. And this, a meeting that we're planning is not up there, but we're also planning a meeting for county commissioners um, across all four states. And so we're gonna get that information out soon. We're just uh, double checking one of the pipeline experts that we wanna have on there, where they will explain to county commissioners, here's what's federally mandated by the FEMSA, but here's what you can do as a county. Um, so it's very clear to those folks. Landowners can get on that call too, but it's gonna be targeted at county commissioners. My, my Dixon County um, supervisor, yeah, and we do have one memo here, so it's on the Bold Alliance letterhead that describes what they can do, but we're gonna have experts, so it's not just coming from an activist group describing that. So, kind of on that, our commissioners have told us that they have told, the summit has told them that there's lots of people signed up. So how do we get them convinced that's a lie? Yeah, I mean, the thing is to just say that it's not true and that if it is true, show us the actual numbers. In Iowa, they only have 20%, I think, signed up. But in Keystone, just to give you an example, they would always tell the landowners, we have 90%. And but they would they never lie, but they never tell the truth. They would say things, they would say things like, we have 90% of our goal. Well, the goal for that quarter may have been, you know, 10 landowners. Mm -hmm. So you really cannot go by what they're saying. The best thing for you to do is talk to your neighbors and say they will use every tactic in the book. And so what we have is people joining together to make sure that there's a strong legal cooperative. To get these commissioners to come to the meetings yes. somewhere. Yeah, and I think the online commissioner meeting is gonna be good, but then we're gonna offer it like I'm going to, I think one in Grand Island here soon. On the third. Yes, to talk about uh, to the commissioners there because they've asked me specifically to come. So. We're happy to do that too, to go to the commissioners. I always make it clear, like, I know as much as I know, but we can also put a pipeline expert in front of them too, so it's not just coming from me. That's where you need to go to your commissioners and ask the exact number. Yeah. Get involved, that's what I'm saying, is get involved with your local government because 
it's easy for these pipelines to talk to your, what do you have, six, seven commissioners? Three. Three? Okay. There you go. Three people. Is it, how is he to pick them off compared to a big room full? That's what I'm talking about. We, I've lived it. Art's lived it. The one so, we questioned, and he turns around and walks off. Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. Yeah. Money talks. He said, "That's yeah." Mm -hmm. yeah. Period. Mm -hmm. And they've got the money to throw around, and you people don't. And you and wouldn't I believe, know it. We wouldn't believe our commissioners would do that. But. Oh, don't, yeah. don't, 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 don't forget, don't do if, if you're involved on the carbon dioxide pipelines, either Navigator or Summit, don't overlook your ethanol companies and their, uh, if they are, uh, if you're an investor in those, we need to start pressuring them and, and getting on them for signing on to these things. In South Dakota, we're really going to work on them because we have investors in most of our companies. In South Dakota, there are seven ethanol companies signed up. Five of them are owned by one company, and the other two are independent. But they have board of directors that are farmers that are running these companies that signed on to this. And keep in mind, we have investors that are upset with them right now because they have kept this planning process secret from their own investors. This, this 45Q tax credit that they're getting to finance this thing, that's the only thing that's making this thing worthwhile for the for, for Rat Center, uh, is what they're going to get. That was signed into law, I think, finally in 2018, and it's uh, what they're going to get. So they've been planning this for the last four or five years and kept keeping it secret. They didn't even tell their own investors what they were doing. And don't let anybody confuse you that you're trying to hurt ethanol because none of us are and my response to them is why are you trying to hurt your own customers and your own investors and, and ruin our land why should we sacrifice our land so you can make a few more bucks i got in a, a discussion a heated discussion with the ceo of glacial lakes energy who, won't, who runs the five in south dakota after one of our meetings in redfield and he said to me what's your solution for us and I said, are you broke? He said, no. Well, I said, then what's your problem? Well, he said, we don't know what's going to happen four or five years if we don't get this. The future for us doesn't look very good. I said, well, us farmers don't know what the future's like for four or five years either, but we deal with it when it comes. And he kept pressing me for a solution. I said, sir, you're getting paid the big bucks to figure that out. But I have investments too. But my investments aren't hurting my neighbor, or they're not expecting my neighbors or any of the other people in the community to sacrifice their livelihood and their land to, so they can make more money. And I think that's the response we have to take. We've let them off the hook too long that they enforce this on us. So I think, what is there, 34, 36 companies signed on? It's time we start putting the pressure on them. Because if you're like me, I mean, I haul corn and ethanol plants. I've used the byproduct. Um, but why did they sign on to this? And to be honest with you, I don't think they knew what they were getting into. I don't think they checked out who they were dealing with. I think they were sold a bill of goods. And I think they're going to get left holding the bag when it's all done. Um, so I would, I would work on that on the ethanol people too. This is what I was talking about, the carbon offsets and carbon pricing. And these are false solutions that are being sold to these companies so that these people in California and Washington and New York and DC can get credits and they can feel good about themselves. It's called greenwashing and all it does is allow big oil and big CEOs to continue to line their pocket while we suffer. I always tell people climate solutions should never put families in We business. we exactly. But well, why why should we why should our lives be put on the line? I mean we're already we already dealing with climate chaos like crazy already. So why should we allow continued mega pollution in these far off cities on our backs and on our back doors? That doesn't make any sense. I want to be re respectful of people's time. Jeff, so let's do one last question. And then Brian and I and uh, the panelists will stay afterwards in case other people need to go, because so, I know it's past the one o'clock. Those materials. 
Yes. But mine's not really more, uh, uh, it's more of a comment than a question, but as long as I get to ask a question, is there anybody else here from Stanton County, Nebraska? We'll talk to you soon. <laughs> but you know, these, these uh, I was made to feel guilty because I'm not behind this, because ethanol is made from corn, and this is Nebraska, and you know, we should be for things. Uh, you know, the ethanol industry is the most heavily subsidized industry in this state. Not only that, but you know how many acres of corn are grown in Nebraska? Does anybody know how much carbon one acre of corn absorbs. Does anybody know that? Absorb what? Seven tons. That's just one acre. Mm -hmm. One acre of corn. Then take that times how many acres of corn we have in this state. I think that we do our more than our job of of carbon capture and and sequestration. Yeah. Right. I really do. That's right. Yeah. You know, and these people in California that you're talking about, I guess they don't have any idea. The trees, all, everything sucks up carbon around here. We don't need to be doing this. Well, this is false greenwashing BS. Yeah. And we were just at the, uh, the summit people, my mother and I, just the other day, and they gave us a, a, an offer of $50,000. But if we acted right away, they'd <laughs> give us an extra $1,000 if we signed that day. And not only that, but they wanted, okay, well, you don't have to sign today, but you got to initial these things. And they wanted us to do that so that they could go back to say, okay, well, we got signatures on this when they didn't. They didn't have any signatures. Yeah, yeah. They weren't going to get any from us. Now, I'm having a hard time selling this thing to my sister, but uh, we don't want this. We don't want this. They're going to come into our place, and our place is uh, east on 275, east of Norfolk. It's up in those hills made out of clay, and they're going to bring that pipeline through, and they're going to try to put it up, not just along the edge of our place. They want to go diagonally right yeah. through the place, yeah. and they're going to tear that stuff up. They're going to, uh, after these, I got maybe four inches of topsoil. After all these winds lately, I'd be lucky to have three inches of topsoil. Yeah. Uh -huh. yep. And they're going to tell me that they can keep that three inches of topsoil away from that clay and not mix it up and <laughs> put it back together yep. and keep it from washing away. Yep. And oh yeah, oh yeah, we're going to do this. Well, I used to be a contractor and I know how contractors work. It's lay as much pipe as you can in one day and to make the money. Yep. And, if yep. you, and if you can do it, if you can lay more, we'll give you more money. Let's do it. <laughs> it. They don't care. They don't care about any of that stuff. And once they're gone, they're gone. Yep. Yep. You're not going to be able to get them back to fix anything. Yeah, I'd like to just mention one thing. You're talking about these contract things. Trans Canada, since we wouldn't sign with them, they sent me a letter offered to pay me $2,500 if I would sign an option to give them an easement. What does that mean? You know? <laughs> really? I mean, they got a lot of tricks in the old book there, and you got to be very careful about it. I don't know people, they took that offer. I mean, you just well sign the easement and do that. I mean, that's basically what you're doing. You got to keep your eyes open. And then they said, if, if you sign now and the pipeline doesn't go through, oh yeah, we'll just give that easement back to you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> My sister ate it up. Yeah. Yep. They own that easement forever and they have the right to sell it to somebody else too. Um, which is what the uh, Frack Gas Pipeline Company is trying to do in Nebraska. Landowners there are now realizing, well, I signed with the Frack Gas Pipeline, but now they're going to convert it potentially to a carbon pipeline. Um, so there's a whole other set of risks then about the steel strength and shut up valves, et cetera, because different pipelines require different things. Um, well, one, I just want to thank everybody uh, for listening to all these lessons because this is like, you know, 12 years, 15 years of pipeline fighting in one panel that you guys got to hear a summary of. Uh, Jeannie and Tom went ahead and put one of each of the materials in these books. 
So you can grab one of these books, or if you have friends and neighbors that aren't here, you can grab a book. It has all the materials inside. It describes the Nebraska Eastman Action Team. If you're not signed up yet, you can go on NebraskaEastman.org and sign up to be a neat member. And that's what then triggers Brian's law firm getting in touch with you about the legal phone calls. In addition to the phone calls that Brian does and Bold and the Eastman teams and all these other grassroots groups, we hold regular pipeline uh, webinars so you can just continue to learn from experts and hear from other land owners. And we're here for you. Brian and I will stick around. I know the panelists will too if you have individual questions. Um, our first priority is to make sure your property rights are protected and, and that they don't use eminent domain for private gain. That is our first priority. And the webinars are recorded. So go on the websites go and, and play them over and over again so you get the information and play them for your neighbors or teach them how to access that information. It's getting more and more readily available. It's more user friendly than it's ever been. And it's just a, I, I'm just so proud and to be a part of, you know, these years of experience and be a small part of, you know, having conversations with many of you and looking forward to future conversations because I, I'm the phone guy. I'll probably be calling you and you'll see this strange number and wonder what, why, why this person called. I'll leave a message and I'll identify myself and, uh, and you can call me back and have your neighbors call me back. Perfect. And so please feel free to take some of the big farm signs, the yard signs, the trespassing signs. We have lots of them. We want them out in the community. It helps. Uh, your neighbors see that there's other people who are close to the pipeline is why we created this stuff. So thank you guys for being here. Oh, perfect. And join Brian Stein Farm Club. The green wash. Yeah. Yeah. Green wash. Yeah. 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 Yeah.